speaker. Um, usually at the end of our, our sessions, we do like to close with um, neuroblastoma survivors uh, to give you a little bit of information on themselves and to give you hope at the end of a day that's just filled with so much medical information and you know your eyes are probably rolling in the back of your heads and so we hope this will end. We've got two speakers actually um, that we're gonna be talking about their experience and I usually like to ask the doctors um, you know, if they have any suggestions or recommendations of people. And Dr. Mathay, uh, first thing, sent me an email and she says, you've gotta to talk to Jay. So to contact him and see if he'd be interested in coming. And so we're very happy to have Jay Farrick. Hello, and as she said, my name is Jay Farrick. Um, this is my first year attending this conference. Uh, I flew out here two days ago with my little brother back there. And um, I'm 20 years old and I was diagnosed with neuroblastoma 15 years ago when I was five. Uh, it was at stage four when they found it. And uh, currently I am a junior at Chico State. I was, uh, as Pat said, invited out here by my doctor, Kate Mathay, who uh, was my doctor at UCSF in San Francisco. Um, we're from Northern California, so all my treatment was about two hours uh, from our house. So many, many drives to San Francisco. So basically, I'm just gonna tell you guys my story, and uh, I didn't do any PowerPoints, I just did a picture slideshow, so I'm be looking down at this a lot, hopefully not a lot, but bear with me. So, uh, my story started out, uh, it was Christmas break of kindergarten in the year 2000, and me and my family were up at our friend's ranch, and uh, I started limping, and my parents didn't really think much of it. Uh, they thought I might have got stung by a bee or rolled my ankle, but I just kept limping and kept limping, and they kind of thought that uh, possibly I was faking it because I would have to start school the next week. And uh, so I, school started and my dad went up to my teacher and said, hey, can you uh, keep an eye on Jay? He's been limping. And we don't know if he was faking it because of school or not. So sure enough, my teacher watched me in at recess. I was, I was limping, so I went and got it checked out. And a local doctor in Ukiah, which is where we live, uh, sent me down to UCSF, or not UCSF, a different hospital in San Francisco because they thought I might have had a bone or a leg disease because they couldn't detect anything. And so we went down there and the hospital in San Francisco didn't really find anything either. And it wasn't until uh, about two or three weeks later I started having really bad pains in my stomach. And uh, the doctor in San Francisco started feeling around in my stomach and uh, they could feel that there was a tumor there uh, they did an ultrasound and there's a tumor about the size of a grapefruit and it had fingers which are parts of the tumor going outward shaped like little fingers and uh, so then that's when uh, the doctors told us I might have something called neuroblastoma and from this point on all of my treatment was at UCSF and uh, I didn't really know what was going on. I was only five years old, so I just thought that I was sick. And my parents didn't really talk about cancer that much. Uh, they didn't mention it to me. They didn't want to scare me. I'm only a little kid, so you guys all know how it goes. So once we got to San Francisco, uh, my parents sat down with the doctors and they uh, outlined my treatment program which was gonna last about 14 months. Uh, the first, first part of the treatment was five to six rounds of chemo to reduce the size of the tumor from the size of a grapefruit to the size of a golf ball. And that took uh, about six months. And I handled it pretty well. I mean, it was the typical chemo side effects, uh, nausea and stuff like that, but um, Basically, I was, I was able to handle it, and I was really drugged up at the time, so I don't really remember much of it. Uh, the things I remember most about going 
to get my treatment are the good things and the happy things. I don't remember much of the bad things. I remember I always looked forward to going to the hospital. So my parents told me, because when you go to the hospital, the doctors and the nurses and the social workers, they're going to treat you like you're the main focus. You're the only one that's getting attention. And as a five-year-old, that's what you want. You want attention. Uh, I remember every uh, room at UCSF had a Nintendo 64 in it. So my brother and I, especially my brother, looked forward. He was only three at the time, so he looked forward to going down there with me. And um, so while I was going through my rounds of chemo, my parents stayed in the local family house, which was right across the street from the hospital, uh, where all the families can stay for free. And one of my parents would stay there with my little brother, and one of my parents would sleep in the lounge chair right next to my bed. I know it wasn't very comfortable. My uh, dad was six foot seven, didn't fit very good in it, but they did it because they were there for me. And uh, as I said, uh, I looked forward to going. And uh, my dad said initially, uh, when they when we got to the hospital and you're on a hospital floor and all you see is other sick children, initially my parents were in denial and they're like, "This isn't happening to us. We're gonna we're gonna get through. It's only gonna take take a couple weeks, a couple months." But as you guys know, it, it doesn't go that quick. And uh, 14 months was how long it ended up going. And my dad said initially. Uh, one second, I need to read this really quick. <laughs> Not read it, but I lost where I was. Yeah, okay. So, so uh, he uh, we initially was in denial, and bad things happen to people every day, and he said, you know, it's how we, re we react is how we're going to get through it. And my parents had a good set of family and friends that were really supportive, uh, always offering to help and he's he was like he had neighbors that would offer to mow our lawn and he was like you know what I, th I think I can mow my lawn I don't, I don't need your help and then he thought well if people are offering to help if I turn them down it's probably not going to make them feel very good so then he was like sure why don't you you guys can mow my lawn and then people would start cooking us meals and my mom's friends would do fundraisers and they had a, a walk called the jaywalk uh, and raised a bunch of money for me and uh, so what my dad said is you got to let people help you you can't get through by yourself you guys aren't we're not all in it alone we have a bunch of family and friends just encourage if people offer to help take it and if you need help ask for it because people are, aren't going to be afraid to help you so uh, next after my initial rounds of chemo to shrink the size of the tumor, it um, was time for uh, my surgery to remove the remaining parts of the tumor. And that was in August, exactly six months after my diagnosis. And my uh, tumor was right above my adrenal gland on my right side. And I have a scar now that runs from my belly button to up here. I call it my shark bite. Uh, <laughs> I work at a local day camp in our town, and when I jump in the pool, every kid's like, what's that? What, why do you have that scar? I just say, it's a shark bike, and they're like, what, really? And then, like, I can't, I don't tell them, but I, just, I can't hold a straight face for very long. But, uh, so, um, after, uh, after the surgery, I, it went well. I was in the hospital for about two more weeks, and then went home. And then September 1st, uh, I was scheduled for my stem cell transplant. Um, for the stem cell transplant, I was in the same room for about 40 days. I, I don't remember much of it. Uh, one thing I do remember was this, the first thing I got, did when I got to the hospital was got to order whatever food I wanted and ordered chicken nuggets. And that's pretty much all I remember about my stem cell transplant. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> during that time, I, uh, I didn't eat for three weeks of the 40 days and had a feeding tube through my nose, and I lost a lot of weight. I was down to about 
35, 40 pounds as a five-year-old. Um, and I had a super high dose of chemo preceding the transplant, and that really weighed me down. And after the transplant, um, one of the things I do remember was after every, um, after every kid's done with their transplant, the whole uh, wing is, uh, there's double doors where you exit, and they uh, tape up like a toilet paper finish line, and all the nurses and doctors line up in a row, and they're all clapping, and you walk through and break the toilet paper, and that's your, you're finishing your rounds of chemo. So I didn't really, or not chemo, uh, stem cell transplant. So I didn't really realize it, but that was one of the, probably the biggest accomplishments of my life at the time. And that's thanks to all these uh, great doctors and nurses that were speaking here today. We couldn't be getting through these times without them. So after these, those treatments, uh, when I came home, my parents were pretty much my nurses. We had a in-home nurse every now and then to come teach some stuff, but they'd change my dressing, flush my Broviac, uh, do blood draws, give me little shots in the hip. Um, so after that, the next, uh, next part of the treatment was radiation. And this was the easiest part of all my treatment. Uh, they did, they did an interoperative radiation during the removal of my tumor. So I only had radiation after that for one week and I only did it for three days. And after the radiation, there was still some active cancer cells in my system. So the next step was to take the 13 retinoic acid, which is Accutane. And my dad told me when he was in high school, he took Accutane. And he was about 200 pounds taking 40 milligrams, and I was more like 40 pounds taking 200 milligrams. So. Uh, and one of the challenges through all my treatment was I couldn't swallow pills at all. So the Accutane, we'd have to pop with a needle, squirt the juice out, and mix it with stuff. And uh, to this day, I have many foods or drinks that I cannot drink anymore because of medicine. Like, I can't drink grape soda, apple juice, mint ice cream, or root beer because I, <laughs> I took medicine with all of them. And every time I take a drink of apple juice, it, I just like cringe because it reminds me of the um, iodine that you have to mix to get the CAT scans, or the, one of the scans. And that just brings back that taste to my mouth every time. So no root beer floats for me. Um, and one of, another thing about taking the pills was my little brother was a big fan of medicine for some reason. He uh, took some medicine that he really liked, I guess, so had a good cherry flavor. So every time I'd take medicine, he'd be like, come on, Jay, I'll take it for you. And, he'd, and he would offer to take my medicine and he would swallow like little M&M pills and be like, look, I can swallow these, you can swallow your medicine. And I, I, I was never able to swallow pills till about my freshman year of high school, actually. Just couldn't get myself to do it. So, um, the last part of uh, all my treatment was uh, a phase one study that I was a part of, which was a trial that all these doctors have been talking about. There's many of them. Mine was the CH14.18 antibody therapy. And uh, pretty much in 2001, they didn't know as much about it, and they were doing phase one study on me and other kids to see how much uh, our bodies could handle. And at one point it got too high of a dose and I couldn't handle it and they had to stop the treatment, uh, take a break for a while, and then they cut it in half. And uh, my parents said that this was the hardest time. It was the most scary time. It was similar to the chemo as uh, in the way I was getting the drugs, but uh, it was way, way harder on my body, and it was just the scariest part for them because it was the end, and they didn't know uh, they didn't know what was going to happen. But it uh, all turned, uh, all ended up turning out pretty good. Um, so it all came to an end, and the, my 14 months of treatment were over, and I was pretty much cancer-free from then on, and uh, I went. 
I'd go to the hospital for MIBG and CAT scans and blood draws and all that stuff for tests every three months for a while and then it turned into every six months and then it turned into every year and uh, this is actually the first summer that I am not going back. Last summer I went to a survivor clinic and they uh, kind of went over all the side of possible side effects or side effects that I could have. I found out some stuff that I didn't even know was a side effect. I just thought it was how I am. And uh, some of them are, uh, I have really high arches in my feet and I that's, didn't know that was a side effect. That was possibly from vincristine because it does something like that. And then in the winter, um, my fingers go really numb and I have no circulation and they go white which it's not really a big deal but I just can't feel them and that was also a side effect of uh, vincristine and I don't really think my growth was stunted uh, it could have been because my dad's 6'7 and my brother's 6'5 and I'm not even 6 foot but I don't think that was one of them but uh, I've always had a really hard time gaining weight I don't know if that was uh, because the scar kind of was like a tummy tuck surgery and it doesn't expand, but I've always had a really hard time gaining weight. Uh, so that's, uh, I guess that's, I haven't had really any emotion, emotional or physical side effects and I've been very fortunate. It didn't really uh, affect my learning at all. Um, I missed the first half of kindergarten and the second and the first half of first grade going through it and uh, if anything it might have matured me a little faster because a lot of kids aren't going to be going through the same stuff you are and I guess uh, I really don't I don't really think about it that much uh, but I live my life each day to the fullest and uh, I participate in Oh, I just realized I probably skipped a bunch of pictures. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll describe some of these pictures. Uh, this one, I don't really know what prompted me to do this, but I got uh, boxing gloves at the dollar store, I remember, with my grandma. And there were some people over at her house, and I just walked out, and I was in my boxers, and I had one sock on and boxing gloves. So my parents took a picture, and it turned into this. And uh, we had these printed up, and they're around the hospital, and all my family members had them. And I know Dr. Mathay had one in her office. But uh, yeah, so that's probably the best poster I've seen in a while. Um, <laughs> and that was before I had my surgery because I, I don't have a scar there yet. And uh, here, this one was at a fundraising golf tournament that some of my dad's friends put on. Here's uh, Golden Gate Bridge. I don't know the I love you sign. Uh, calendar. All these pictures are from a calendar. Uh, since we didn't have like computers with pictures on them, all our pictures were uh, hard copies, so I just had to take pictures of my iPhone and put them on my computer. Here's... Uh, me and my brother always, uh, he would always jump in my bed and play Game Boy with me because I got a Game Boy as a gift and uh, he was pretty jealous of that. And my mom's friends uh, put a, raised some money and put it together and you can see there's two Game Boys. They're both in his hand actually when he's hugging me. <laughs> <They're>, uh, <laughs> there's a green one and a yellow one, so, yep. And uh, this is the last picture on there. And uh, it's, that was taken about two or two years ago on a family trip. Um, and so other events that I've uh, participated in since the year 2000, I've been involved in the Relay for Life. I uh, cut the ribbon a couple of years with a couple of my friends that also were going through cancer. And my dad and my mom were a big part of the Relay for Life. And uh, I spoke at a fundraiser in February for the family house where we stayed and uh, that was that was pretty cool because it was a fundraiser and it was all these like super rich people coming to San Francisco 
and I did a little speech, and after, it was like way shorter than this, but, uh, uh, and right after it, they raised $500,000 for the family house, and they weren't even bidding on anything. They were just raising their paddles and giving out money. And I, <laughs> I don't know, you could talk to Dr. Mathe about that one. And then I did another one for the V Foundation uh, with Jim Valvano, who passed away from cancer a while ago, who was NC State's coach for basketball, has a big uh, fundraising foundation. And they did a video of me in eighth grade, which I'm going to show now. Good catch. Um, all right, Mike's not working. But I can talk loud enough. Um, so they did a video of me to raise money for the V Foundation, and they were doing a fund in need, and they were donating all the money. So this was about six years ago, all to uh, neuroblastoma research for Dr. Mathay. Uh, at UCSF and they raised over a million dollars after they showed my video and that went all to UCSF the year they became a children's hospital. So next I can uh, show this little quick video and I think that's about it. <laughs> Jay Farrick is a survivor of childhood cancer. While in kindergarten, he was diagnosed with neuroblastoma. You never expect something That's my dad. this serious to happen to one of your own. And uh, when they told us that Jay had cancer, um, it changed our whole life. Today, he's a healthy teenager. Um, I'm just a normal kid. I play sports, I play basketball. I go to school. I just graduated from eighth grade yesterday. Baseball game tonight. I do everyday regular stuff. Jay's doctor, Kate Mathe, is an oncologist specializing in the treatment of neuroblastoma. It is a very, very serious cancer that we find only in young children. More than 50% of children have the cancer already spread to their bones and to their bone marrow at the time that the cancer is detected. That is what Jay Farrick presented with when I first met him more than 10 years ago. At the time of his diagnosis, fewer than 15% of children survived metatastic neuroblastoma. Jay fought the cancer and won. His struggle was an inspiration to Vintners Dick and Anne Grace. Uh, Andy and I had the, the extraordinary privilege of walking uh, a portion of Jay's cure path alongside both he and his family. And it was there that we got uh, the opportunity to see the courage and see the commitment and the resolve that they had uh, in navigating this path. In 2001, Dick and Anne awarded a V Foundation Vintners grant to Dr. Kate Mathe in honor of Jay Farrick. And this grant was used to develop a new, very exciting, targeted radiotherapy for neuroblastoma. This has so far proved to be one of the most active treatments for widespread and resistant neuroblastoma that we have added to the chemotherapy. But this work is not complete. There are still children who do not win their battles with cancer. Tonight, the money raised for the V Foundation Fund the Need will go to support the continued work of Dr. Kate Mathe and her research into a cure for neuroblastoma. So without the support of generous people like yourself and foundations, it wouldn't be possible to do either the laboratory research or the clinical research that is essential to bring these treatments forward and save our children. When I go to UCSF, we go visit uh, Seven Long before I was on, and I see all the kids there, and I hope that they see how I am and hope that they can be cured and be a regular kid like me. You know, tonight's a night where we get a chance to really grab on to one of those opportunities, and that is to share our capital, to share our well-being, so that we can fund research that rids us of this horrible scourge of cancer that so many people 
uh, have to deal with. Uh, the statistics are spot on on us making progress. We get a chance tonight to, uh, to accelerate the progress that's already been made and push it to a new level. So I actually found a few more things I can talk about. I didn't realize I put these notes at the end of my speech. Um, so just a few other things that uh, I'm sure all your guys' kids have to uh, deal with that I remember I had to deal with while I was going through it was I uh, had just got a, before I was diagnosed, I had just gotten a bike for Christmas. And it was really tough because I was not allowed to ride my bike because my platelets were too low. And uh, another one of the challenges was I couldn't, we had a swimming pool in our backyard and uh, I couldn't swim because I had my Broviac in. And uh, so my mom and dad let me uh, be in control of the pool and uh, I got to let everyone know when they could swim or when they couldn't swim. <laughs> but I would sit out there and I guess I would just let them know, yeah, you can go in or no, you gotta get out or you can jump in or, and then another thing that uh, my taste buds did change a lot. Um, before I had all my treatment, I, uh, I liked milk and seafood a lot. And afterward, I, I've never liked the taste of milk at all. And I still don't like seafood. And I used to love it. And uh, I don't know if uh, this is why, but why I didn't like milk, but I used to drink it, and now I found out about a year ago that I was lactose intolerant, so that's probably why I didn't like it. But, uh, yep, so uh, th I'm gonna end my speech. Uh, that's about all I got. And I'm gonna end it with a quote from Jimmy V, which is, don't give up, don't ever give up. And uh, if you guys have any questions, I'll answer them, but I don't know how well I will be able to answer them. <laughs> Thank you. Um, where's Jay's brother? So you're the troublemaker? <laughs> where's your Nintendo? <laughs> um, we have another speaker. I just wanted to say that I wanted to Give a round of applause to Jay's brother, too, for putting for up all of us. <laughs> I, I think he turned out very well for all of us. So our next speaker um, has come to our conference uh, quite a few times, five times? OK. Um, she's our resident singer as well, so she'll be singing for us again tonight. Um, we thought it'd be nice to have her come and talk and do uh, her survivor story and what she's been up to and what she's been doing recently and tell her story. And this is Emily Ware from Ohio. Hi, I'm Emily and I am now almost 14 years old. I was diagnosed with neuroblastoma cancer in July of 2003 when I was only two years old. My initial tumor grew out of my right adrenal gland and attached to my right kidney, liver, and wrapped around all five of my arteries. It was five and a half by six and a half inches. I had the first of five ports placed and started high dose aggressive chemo, in which I spent 25 days a month inpatient for six months. Then after shrinking the tumor, I had a seven hour surgery at Children's in Cincinnati and 90%, 95% of my tumor was removed. Then I went to Columbus Children's on Christmas Day of 2003 for a stem cell transplant. This was 30 days in one room. After transplant, I had three weeks of radiation, which I was sedated every day. Finishing with six months of the magic bullet, a monocule antibody infused through an IV for a week impatient for one week every month. Then I was in remission for 10 months and went for routine scans in July 
of 2005 and relapsed with a four-inch tumor around my aorta behind my heart. So then we started low-dose outpatient chemo in which I got chemo every day for 10 days on and two weeks off for 24 months. I had open heart surgery at Children's Columbus three days before Christmas 2005. Then I had three weeks of radiation again in April 2006. I finished my 24 months of chemo in June 2007 and I was announced NED, no evidence of disease. I was without treatment for three, two and a half years and was able to grow hair, attend school, church functions, play softball, and was loving life. Then in January of 2010, I was complaining of back pains and headache daily. So my mom told my doctor and he ordered scans. I relapsed again. This time a tumor grew out of a gland in my neck and was wrapped around my juggler vein and my spinal cord. This is why I had back pains and headaches. This time I had my 18th surgery for my fifth port place to start chemo. I, I immediately, in which I get, in which, in which I had chemo five days, Monday through Friday, one week on and two weeks off until January of 2011. I was supposed to have major open heart surgery the day before Easter, but thank God my tumor shrank so small the surgeon didn't need to do the surgery. So I started three weeks of radiation every day, followed by five days of chemo. Wait, I lost my place. Okay. So I started three weeks of radiation every day, followed by five days of chemo. I have had issues with aggressive treatment, hearing loss, optic nerve damage, kidney damage, and I have also lost two inches in height. This is minor compared to the, some of the things I have experienced. Me, my mommy, and my family are just thankful that we have had great support from our friends, church family, and our community. It has officially been three years and seven months since my last treatment. Another side effect I have had is I cannot get braces or orthodontic care due to short roots from shrinkage done by transplant and I did not receive four of my adult teeth. My advice for all of you families here, there is hope, so never stop believing. And as I once quote, never ever give up. And I am now able to do Scottish Highland dancing, and I also, um, I also play the violin in the orchestra. So thank you for listening to my story. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Emily. That was wonderful. Um, I know everybody's tired. We're got medicine all over the brain. <laughs> Um, like I said, we have taco night tonight, so hopefully that will be easy to do. Um, I think it's 6.30 or 7. I can't even remember anymore since I don't have my computer. So uh, dinner will be next door. We'll have the DJ and dancing. So go back, kind of uh, regroup a little bit, and hopefully we'll see you like 6.30 or 7 o'clock. So enjoy. Thank you.